Well, um, okay, I guess I'll begin with my pronouns are she, her, and thank you for inviting me. Um, and also thank you for everything you do on behalf of the poetry and writing community. And Bonnie, wherever you are, I'm excited that we're gonna share this time together. And of course, thank you everyone for showing up. I know time is a commodity. So I'm gonna read a few poems and then during the last minutes, I'm gonna share some visuals with you. Uh, okay, so we've all been through a lot. Um, COVID has been an existential crisis for many of us, probably all of us. And Adam Grant wrote a piece in the New York Times it was titled, There's a Name for the Blah You're Feeling. It's called Languishing. So I thought I would begin with a spring poem about this languishing time that we've been going through and also about my love for PK, my wife of 44 years. Well, we didn't get married until our 37th year until uh, same-sex marriages were legal. But anyway, the languishing anguish of May. A carpet of cherry blossoms, wind blown, pink fallen fragility. It knows of loneliness. I pick myself up, ridding my highs and lowliest lulls, spring squeezing and crushing of petaled souls. Miles and years away in Volunteer Park before we were blown to unknown boundaries in the skin of things opposite we carved our initials into the trunk of an evergreen. Existential examination, our etched existence. I've written this poem 100 times, sad wounded adjectives sutured together, a lifelong refrain, things go by faint, forgotten. Still today in this saddened living room where love and vows happen, she whispers in my ear, come on, baby, we can do this. The next poem uh, was published in Dream of the River, which was a, um, a queer anthology and um, continuing and oh, and the proceeds went to the Trevor Project, which is an LG for um, suicidal prevention for the LGBTQ community. And love. I stood in the gallows of love, bathed barefoot among sticks, river stones, floated in the Hudson River, polluted roar, ripped crusted sourdough bread in two. Our x ray love, a mass of Seattle prehistoric gray fog, initials femme carved in the skin of an evergreen. Lasting, 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 steadfast, staunch, unswerving, our once anonymous stealth, now out, out, out. Our secret to survival, knowing what to preserve, knowing what to keep, knowing what to throw away, knowing I'll never leave you, knowing she'll never leave me, knowing forever and eternity, a destiny, knowing coupled light shade. On her sternum, a 45-year-old red rose fades. On my chest, four blue dot radiation tattoos remain. Our 41st year, we go to Black Dolphin to get needled. Her tatsu cover up, a friendly fierce water dragon. Under my right carpus, an ampersand and red heart. Our tattoos, an indelible, unassuming wedded poem. Okay, like I said before, we've all been through a lot. We've been through pandemic mass. We've been through pandemic protests. Uh, we've been through, some of us have been boosted. We've been through pandemic boosters. We've been through a pandemic election. We've been through a pandemic insurrection and now the invasion of Ukraine. But here's a different side of that story to consider. Appeared at Artifact. I have never been popular. What is it like to be the Mona Lisa 
the two and a half foot tall portrait of Lisa Garadini, the wife of Francesco Del Ga Gondol, to be loved and overloved, to be a perf peered at artifact, to be the most visited piece of art painted on poplar. What is it like in this time of Corona to be nailed on a, re a freestanding wall behind bulletproof glass, to be finally a woman herself alone? Okay, obviously I, I write a lot about love and I took a class with Jericho Brown and he is the creator of the duplex and the duplex has a lot of repetition. It's a structure and the first and last lines are the same. And there's uh, 14 lines and there's nine to 11 syllables in each line. Saturday afternoon couplets after reading the tradition by Jericho Brown. This love poem, a breeding ground for myth, a pointillistic smattering of time. Our time, a pointillistic smattering suffering species, dying planet. Dying planet, suffering species, markers of biological chaos. These markers of biological chaos, under and over and double exposed, under and over and double exposed, sprockets of film frame precarious bodies sprockets of film frame precarious bodies. If bones were dug up whole, what's in us? If my bones were dug up whole, what's in me? This love poem, a breathing ground for myth. Again, the next poem is about navigating all this turmoil that we've been witnessing. Lost compasses. A coupled nation married to blue and divorced red once bespoke my queer Jewish blue, my feminist take back the night, climate change blue, my ancestors immigrant blues. Yesterday, the Red Repub stormed the Capitol, desecrated the desk of the female speaker spread feces on the walls of the house, and I looked up nefarious, fragrantly wicked, impious, evil. When all this is over, will we, the dismissed, find ourselves lost on the edge, without GPS, dreaming of astrolabes, remembering sextons? Is it possible to be a custodian a steward and a citizen. I wonder if there is a tomorrow. I think as artists and poets, we are the ultimate observers in the world. And I love walking in my neighborhood. A leopard in my Ravenna Bryant neighborhood on my walk in the neighborhood, a walk walked 100,000 times, a route where I believe I've seen everything there is left to see. I see something never seen before. A crow on top of a jungle gym. How could I have missed it? How do we miss these startling things? On my walk to my bed, a walk walked a million times, a passage where I've seen everything close to me. I see something never seen before, a spider crawling out of a crack in the wall. How could I have missed it? How do we miss these shattering things? On my walk to my grave, a walk walked many a nighttime, a cemetery where I've seen chaos, conflict, decay, death, everything I'm supposed to see. I see something never seen before. A leopard sitting atop a stone slab, luring me. How could I have missed her? How do we miss these spotted savage things? Okay, 
The next poem is the only family poem I will read tonight. I'm in a biracial relationship. PK is Japanese American and I'm an Ashkenazi Jew. And her mother, Mitzi Kunitsuku, was the matriarch. And she was very superstitious. South China Dinner, May 24, 2003. Saturday night Chinese dinner with PK's family. Turns out there are 13. Her mother says we cannot be 13 at the table. I decline, stay home and watch the thief. Well, in my 20s, I was a fruit picker in Eastern Washington for three years, and we picked cherries and apples and pears. And this poem is a tribute to William Carlos Williams' plum poem titled, This Is Just To Say. Red Bing cherries and pink plastic rollers. One, in Kashmir, I picked red Bing Washington cherries that were flown to Japan. Two, pink plastic rollers and bobby pins and two beer cans on the crown of my head and I ironed my hair to make it all straight. Three, the plane ride from Washington state to Japan is not straight. Four, the straight and narrow path is non-existent. Five, this is just to say I have eaten those fucking Rainier cherries you left in the fridge. I've been reading an article about whether rivers have rights and people um, in Florida are suing on behalf of the rights of the of rivers. So this is my nature poem for you tonight. Pilford. In the whole rain forest on the Olympic Peninsula, I stood on a tree stump with camera in hand and mourned the tree, yanked from the land, dragged to the road, carted away with chains, pilfered from the scene, sliced into smaller pieces. The next piece I'm gonna read is about the Me Too, Too movement, which of course we know that it's been going on for centuries. Crying Horror Show. When we were girls, we showed each other our wounds, splotched terror, pressed on our skin, undersides of anatomy, volcanic eruptions, her blood smeared on my blood. Now the women cry, me too, me too, me too, me too, me, 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 me. It happened to me. And everyone goes to work as if it were an ordinary day. The way I see it, the world cannot wait for the bosses of the earth to relinquish the regime. Speaking of bosses, I'm a workhorse. I've been working most of my life and I've had some great bosses and I've had some terrible bosses, which I know you all have too. Windowsill. I place my boss's head on the windowsill. Cinematic light shines on his temples. I have removed his tongue. My boss no longer stands before me, no longer lords over me, no longer determines my future, no longer demeans me, no longer lies to me, no longer pretends to be my friend. A man silenced me in public and it really hurt. It hurt so bad and I'm sure we've all been silenced. This is a poem I wrote about him. Anonymous, your father killed a man, smoked a cigarette and ate his ear. The son descended and he confessed father to son, his drunken family confession under the white incandescent moon. 
the last bright thing inside me stolen by your hands wrapped around a wine glass stem. But here I am for the last time on the hill in the Gary room, drunk on poetry, drowning with all fathers and sons. <clears throat> I heard you left our city on a horse, reins in your hands. Where are you going, silencer? Far, far away. The city stands without your sound. Soundless, I stand without your sound. Anonymous to the rest of the world, you flee as a fragile, nameless fragment, a tyrant of our time. Um, I'm a copy editor and sometimes I write about punctuation and some people do not like punctuation, but to me, punctuation is like polish. The hyphen. The tiny dash, the smallest of all dashes, is a wet behind the ear kiss, compounding tongue to heart, matter upon matter, two nouns inseminating and cementing love and doom. Uh, this is the last poem that I'm going to read. I think uh, every writer has a writer that they adore. And Virginia Woolf is mine. I, in my 20s, I read all of her books and all of her diaries. V.W. Stone's sister and husband. How many times she sat in the Virginia Woolf writing lodge, the cold wooden garden shed, leaned into a chair, a board on her lap, used as a prop to write just like her father. How many times fire in her bones she kept to herself, dog paws on her pages, a marmoset's jealous gaze, seven cigarettes a day. How many times she fought the urge to burn her words, to keep to herself, to fill her coat pockets with stones and walk into the river ooze, to drown herself, her hat and cane found on the bank. Three weeks later, her body washed ashore in Sussex. How many times she saw the horrible horizon and wrote to her sister Vanessa, to her husband Leonard, I feel certain that I am going mad again. So thank you. So much of what I'm going to be reading tonight are poems that have been inspired by travel. The first two um, have a little something to do with the phenomenon uh, that often happens in travel, which is falling in love, which may or may not be with a person. This is called The Language of Color. I dreamt of the dreamer sun much loved, long awaited, wrapped in a cloak of colorful words, envisioning spirits ascending and descending the ephemeral ladder, connecting earthly striving and eternal longings. He spoke in hues, hieroglyphs and logograms, laughed in cotton candy, smiled in crimson and tangerine, whispered in periwinkle, kneaded my flesh until it faded mulberry to dappled rose, held me tight through the Prussian then charcoal hours until daylight streamed flaxen and honey, gentling us awake. I opened my eyes, the nocturnal visitor had gone, around me lilting ancient Aramaic, forming lullabies and family stories, marketplace bartering, mother's chatter preparing meals. Tonight, as others search the skies for the Persaids glowing gaseous tails, I wait, sepia and umber, quiet as shadow. Listen as the night's shimmera fades to abalone. And this is called, He Had Your Laugh. 
Within a few words, I placed the telltale cadence from the homeland once my home. I recognized what my grandmother called her gypsy blood, la oscuridad of whole peoples seeping through, the unapologetic smile, the weary sigh, dark eyes, tawny skin, the microtonal half-stepped laughter gliding upward, composing a song none hear sing. It was your laugh. The one from our late night under the centuries rooted olive tree. Our stories new to one another, seated rapturous intimacy, possible only between strangers. We slid into the timeless rhythm. The song had always been ours, though it hadn't played before. Tonight, I felt it thrum again, willing my hands note to note across the Ouija board of your shoulders to your back, your neck to the place where your hair brushed your shirt collar to the weight of your head in my lap, spelling your name. He became the medium, allowing passage between the world of once upon a and the world of ever after. The ceaseless drift further from time that once was our time. Moonlight is moonlight wherever it falls. Once it fell on us. And um, now as, as Leopoldo was reading to you some of my um, comments about having spent some time in Guanajuato, Mexico and the upcoming book that's coming out uh, and the upcoming uh, writing retreat in June, if anyone is interested, shoot me a message in the chat and I can send you the website link for that. I'm going to read a couple of poems in each of the four sections of the book. So Dreaming in Cantera, or uh, in Spanish, it's Soñar con la Cantera. Cantera is a kind of stone um, found in this particular region of Mexico. It's white or pink or green, and it's quite astonishing. And the book takes the form of a journey with four sections of an arc. The first part where we leave, the second part where we are on our journey, having our experiences. The third section is in those luscious moments of arrival or belonging or feeling like we're coming home. And then as with any cycle, the fourth section gets us ready to start out again. So the first section taking leave, this is called New Constellation. We are made of dust of stars which came from the nothing, the nothing that came before everything that will come once again. I am the descendant of those who left and survived, who resisted the call of the abyss, who traveled across ocean or land, who said goodbye or crept in silence, who fled wars or gas chambers, who remained or turned to dust. Don't be surprised I'm gone. When night darkens, look upwards to the points of light. Trace my head, my back, two legs walking away. And this next poem um, is inspired by the mountain range in this particular area of Mexico, which is the mountains are not quite like the Pacific Northwest mountains here with um, gorgeous peaks and uh, snowfall. They are smoother and they are rounder, although of course when you're on them they're jagged and, and high, um, but from the distance they look like the backs of frogs which is what the name Guanajuato means in Nahuatl, the native indigenous language is the land of frogs. This is called Where the Wind Takes Me. I walk the same path as the burros from Monte de San Nicolas across the Cerro of La Crucita, climb little by little toward the white cross I'm not sure I'll reach. I am the sole wayfarer, pockets filled with whimsy, wisps of song. On my back, I've no bags of sand, charcoal, cement, 
No firewood or water jugs that wait me to the land. Nothing assures I'll remain tethered when gusts of wind carry those not meant to stay. And if I did break free, a balloon slips from the child's grasp, catches and deflates in a branch, raining latex confetti. A plastic bag swirls, rises only to fall and eddy in a playground corner or river bend. I want to land fresh, a curious inhabitant. The wind pushes from behind, lifts the cap from my head. I close my eyes against the sting, stand still, face to the heavens, arms lifted, waiting to be unloosed. And in the second portion, uh, the experiences uh, on a journey, this next poem has some language regarding to local legends. Uh, one including um, a woman called La Llorona, the weeping woman, who is said to have uh, killed her children in a jealous rage, and her punishment then is to have spent the rest of her days wandering in a horrifying grief that she had just killed her children. Another legend has to do with the mummies of Guanajuato, that is M-U-M-M-I-E-S, mummies. Um, there are minerals in the soil that uh, some people, when they have been buried, some people have been buried alive and their bodies have been completely mummified. This is called String of Broken Promises. Beware the enchantment of legends. The princess who lives in the bluffs, famed with beauty no lover can resist. Awaiting the suitor who overcomes all false temptations, she waits still. The soil with minerals so rich, not even death takes the boots, dress, eyes, teeth, or hair. Vanity here persists after the grave. The weeping woman in white, cursed for drowning her children to wander in endless grief. Remorse comes too late for jealous rage. Sacrifices made to ill-suited love. The minstrels who play and lure thousands of years after their, their devil's pact, no longer able to love a mortal, they roam the cafes, streets, symphonies, strumming, arcing wild horse hairs taut across vibrating strings, fingering ivory keys and curved sensuous necks. A thousand sonatas, a thousand cups of mezcal, yet they remain hollow. The woman who offers shelter a cup of wine, her own ivory neck upturned. Love a thousand kisses deep, nothing will reach the vacant chamber where his heart once beat. Seeing only his gleam and potential, she accepts his trinkets, unstrung pearls, unhinged jewelry case, broken promises. On the night when the moon is almost full and strong March winds mask the howls of wild dogs in La Llorona, music swells on the streets, moves light-footed through arches, bridges, tunnels. Darkness hides the crumpled disrepair. Limestone wash cracks off ancient stone walls. Poets and pilgrims, we see this as beauty, a story not yet at its end. Oh, traveler, you have succumbed to the enchantment of the ruined, the romance of the decay. And another one from uh, this section, this poem speaks a little bit to the uh, soundtrack that I heard uh, on a daily basis in Mexico. Uh, Mexico is perhaps a noisy place sometimes, uh, including living close enough behind uh, um, a church that I was able to hear the, uh, the bells that it rang every 15 minutes, every hour of the day and night. This is called, I don't know the name. Everything has a name, even if we don't know it. What is the name the wind whispers? 
the lullaby hums to the baby, the angels sigh when they close our eyes. I do not know the name of this morning's pink orange sky, striated with slate clouds, so thick I forget the sun remains behind it. Perhaps its name is only known by those who choose the morning song. Each day a different version set to the unalterable rhythm of the quarter hour bells of the Templo de, de, de la Calzada de Guadalupe, the mules braying low and ragged, the roosters crooning, birds chattering. The thick fat bees gloat, hover in the hibiscus. My pen scratches against the page, marks I will not be able to read later, my handwriting illegible as my father's. And just then I hear his voice join this morning's chorus. Today's song has been chosen by the ghosts of the hill, the only ones who know the true name of this sky. What to call a daughter who gets closer to a father, the farther away she gets. And we're now at part three of the book, The Moments of Arrival, Coming Home. This is called Watching Saturn Rise. Spotlights illuminate the neoclassical Teatro Juarez, the Baroque dome of La Basilica de Nuestra Señora de Guanajuato, the green and white cantera of the Universidad, creating an Orion's belt from which I navigate home. Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn have risen early. They brew their first cup and gaze into the still black. Mars, who was up first, greets Jupiter. Both chide sleepy Saturn. All three offer the tiniest curl of a smile to the early riser on this planet's Mexican hillside. Abandoned decades ago by the, by the gods of sleep, we awaken in brisk darkness, wrap ourselves in awe and wonder, an old sweater that will become oppressively warm. We lean on the balcony, step outside or stand at the kitchen window, Coffee quickly cooling. We have only three phases, our rise, our set, and the arc we draw between them. Each day too has these phases, yet this is not enough to break slumber's spell. What rouses is the awareness of being closer to the set than the rise. Mars has already died. Jupiter is slowly shrinking, Saturn is losing its rings to its own gravity. I too have survived deaths, lost an inch in stature, watched three shimmering rings slip like rain in magnetic storms. We'll meet again tomorrow morning, send a silent greeting, a nod of encouragement. There's still something we each must do in the arc of our journey until we travel no more. Okay, and I think I have time for one more. Okay, no one is saying no. <laughs> so I'm going to say yes. So this last, uh, the last poem that I'm going to read is also from this this third section. I'm going to save the the um, the setting out again for when the book comes out uh, and we gather again for a book launch or a reading of some sort. Um, and this poem starts with uh, two uh, short quotes from other people. The first is from Hafiz. Don't surrender your loneliness so quickly. Let it cut more deep. Let it ferment and season as few human or even divine ingredients can. Something missing in my heart tonight has made my eyes so soft, my voice so tender, my need for God absolutely clear. And the next is by Rachel Naomi Remen. The places in which we are seen and heard are holy places. The loneliness of the Nopal. One, it should be the rainy season. Three wet days, three weeks ago are not enough for the soil, the trees, the skin, a soul. Dusty brown earth clings to my clothes and shoes. I inhale and it rattles my lungs. 
smudges my long-held sense of self. What can grow in the dust? Nopales. La planta de vida, the plant of life, seemingly immortal, survives the dry Mexican desert alongside its people. Tough, these two, who protect their internal sweetness with thorns. Where their leaves fall, new ones grow. Desert dwellers must endure drought. It is here I fell and was born anew. Two. The oldest prickly pear grow high in the hills, their desolate slopes the color palette of death. The strong and noisy wind shakes their shoulders with unanswered questions. No one is here at this hour, though I see tracks, hoof prints, dung, a burrow laden with sacks of dirt or coal or firewood, and a young man to lead it, crossed from the other side, a small village, or perhaps something that once was a small village. What can grow in the dust? Loneliness. I cannot say everything I want to in their language. What I utter is met with smiles, but not understanding. My pink tones and brown curly hair don't hold their gaze. I don't know the melodies, can't follow along when evening turns to song. I sing to myself in my mother tongue. A blank canvas without even a fingerprint or trace of another's hands. I have grown thick and thorny in this season of untouchability. This exterior will require a machete to cut its defenses to reach the sweetness within. Three, a nopal outlives humans. Each year it produces brilliant fleshy green stems. At the beginning of rainy season, they blossom into fruit sweet and filled with seeds. One cactus can feed generations. Its leaves and fruit brought to market or charred on the comal at home or boiled or pickled or eaten fresh the moment the needles have been plucked. All that is needed is someone to walk into the grove, lean in to cut its leaves and pick its fruit, withstand being pierced by the unavoidable thorns. What can grow in the dust? the woman who harvests nopales. I was alone when I climbed the cerro. Descending, I see a woman standing within the grove. She has the merest of protection and tools, a brown face, a white blouse, basket for the harvest, a stick and a knife. She is alone in this hot and barbed place where it is impossible to distinguish the burn of the spines of the hunger of isolation. Four, I am perforated. The blood stains, covers everything. I lean into the thorns. The sting leans into me. I reach for the highest and greenest leaves, for the memories that will yield sweet fruit and scars. I let it cut deeper, desire to taste for myself what God has protected behind thorns. I cannot distinguish razors in my fingers from the thrum of walking through a boarding gate. What can grow in the dust? My soft eyes that seek the divine. My tears stain clear like aloe vera from the stalk I've just cut. The nopal and I stand tall, each seeking something more to withstand the loneliness. I see you, I say, looking up. I hear you, it says, looking down. Sing with me, I ask. Dance with me, it replies. We lean into each other, getting used to the pain. We begin to share our stories, our tears meld. We have made this place holy. Thank you very much.
Today I got one, I got a couple of poems I just got published here. And this one was just published by the Parkland Ports. It's, they're out from uh, Storning Play in Alberta, Canada here. And this is online. It's on Facebook. They, they, what they did this year for uh, the poetry month of April, they just got everybody put uh, a poem in and every day they put a poem right out on Facebook and on their site. So this one I call Old Billboard. Old billboard on the side of the road, faded, shaded, speechless, but the story's told, walk a little while with nothing. The forgiven footsteps linger behind, questions gathering in the palm of the hand, lay down breathing, close eyes, didn't hold up the bridges, Things just slipped away. Don't read, didn't read the rooted catchwords written on a sign. Now walking on an empty road, barefooted and long-winded, wondering, what did I do wrong? And this next one is actually also published in uh, uh, the Park Parkland's uh, book there. They got coming out here right away here. This one's called Sleep. Sleep. Sleep into the night. Sleep into the deep. Sleep into a world. Sleep on the words. Sleep to what has been said. Sleep to those who heard. Sleep to those who understood. Sleep to those who shed tears. Sleep to the whisper around the ears. Sleep to relieve loved ones. Sleep to those who walk in your footsteps. Sleep to those them on their own road. Sleep to forgive. Sleep that you lived, sleep to those that will remember, sleep to your time, sleep to the dust, and move on. Thank you. Thank you, Lobordo. And thanks for letting me hear. I missed the in-person last one. Okay, now, I thank Jerry Gale and Bonnie Wolkenstein. And Jerry Gale mentioned Virginia Woolf. By uh, coincidence, my poem also has Virginia Woolf on it. <clears throat> All right. I thought that's kind of funny. <clears throat> okay, the first, I'll read two poems. <clears throat> the first one is called Mirror on the Wall. Truthful to a fault is the mirror on the wall. Every wrinkle, scar, and wart it shows all. Could it speak what might not tell about thoughts heard, feelings revealed? The therapist then could learn from the mirror the patient's travail, confusion, denial. An artist that does the psyche unveil a picture of Dorian Gray, obverse helping heal. You have been behaving strangely recently. It was hard to say, but had to be said. The mirror haunted eyes, taut lips revealed. I'm fine. You just have been stressed out lately. My pulse does temperately keep time as we sit upon this bench beside the lake. How tranquil is the surrounding scene, yet your hands twitch, eyes sidelong glance. I am fine. Let us walk along the water line. The water will mirror my face. Your hand in mine will stop me doing a Virginia Woolf. Genuine is your concern, but really, I am fine. The fault lies not in the stars, but in ourselves. Pay attention to the mirror, to honest friends. Take a hatchet, chop down the tree of excuses. Forgo further denial, be cured of your illness. <clears throat> Essentially, this is uh, 
towards a lot of uh, mental illness patients don't take their medicines and uh, you know don't believe that there is that there is anything wrong with them so this is essentially addressed towards them okay and what was it yeah okay <clears throat> Then the second one is called the misfit. Characterized by the bell curve, a population's bookends are the misfits. The bell's main denizens flaunt their conformity, extol their normalcy, revile the left's impairments, deride the right's potency. To conform, be accepted, be liked, at least left alone is a consummation devoutly to be wished. That's, that's of course from Hamlet. That one temptation yielded to spelt destruction. This one plodded on, driven his way, the pilot light his own. In school, the library drew him, not the playing field. The contortions he performed were those of the mind, not gymnastics. The rope he could not climb till it rained. In the jumps, with a huge effort, he on the line did land. Driven, desirous to know, to excel, he plunged into mathematics, science, literature, learned the skill of self-teaching never taught. Dreamed dreams of novels written, a dancing figure in carved. His gravity, reading choices, Seniors aggravated, tossing his books around him, they bullied. For most among them, for him, a grim future predicted. He'll just be a mad scientist and come to a bitter end. With them, he did not for forbearance plead. That would have their efforts augmented. Instead, a near expression free body maintained. Eventually, they passed and he was free. Chosen for him was a path well traveled, like flexible misfits of the right kind adjusted. Adjusted. No madding crowds plaudits, but joy of feats performed. The pa paths of glory lead but to the grave, recited. The misfit skills were by teachers duly praised, but gymnastics a bright career predicted. That the misfit forever in his heart etched. It's the way we have in Sanawa Echo. <clears throat> so basically the, the paths of glory lead but to the grave is from uh, uh, Thomas Gray's elegy written in a uh, country churchyard. And, and of course the, uh, you know, which one was it? Uh, it's, it's a consummation devoutly to be wished, it's from to be the speech to be or not to be, uh, Hamlet, Prince of Denmark. So the poem I'm going to read tonight is uh, titled Penthesilea. And Penthesilea was an Amazon queen known for her great beauty and prowess in battle. Um, she was killed by Achilles, who, upon removing her helmet after he killed her, fell in love with her. It's in two parts. And so the first part is sort of a reimagining of that tale. And then the second part is a more modern uh, telling. One, daughter of war, her armored breast, her queen light head, her golden belt adorns. She wields her sword, her spear, her crescent shield, sun dogs hang from her ears. On her back, a quiver, cedar shafts, a sinewed bow, she hunts for dove and deer, her wrists twist, her arrow airs, her sister queen is slain. She bites her lip, bears her breast, she lactates tears, her unshot, uh, unshut eyes, her brown gold pink, mountain edged, the empty step, blood has shed, her sister dead, she mounts her horse, her tears have spread, she rides Aegean shores. She wages war, Achilles dread, their shield to shield, their spear to spear, their head to head, he wants her dead. She does not dread his murder plot. She will not seek his heel, his sandaled foot. 
she will find his knot, his heart, his softest spot, and then she's dead. He mourns the leaded sphere that led to hear his where, his why, his she must die. He rants, he wails, his spear and sword, the shield he wields, his ward of swords, his army built, but she is dead. The world now torn, he loved her more. She downs her head, her beauty bled. She's dead, she's dead. Her life now gone, the death knell bell, the gong, the wailer's song, her life now sprung, she's gone, she's gone. A wooden boat will take her home, her bones alone, her muscle gone, her beauty stung, her wisdom won, her breast, her heart laid bare, her life now sung in word and song. Two. Between her legs, a harley roars, her chrome, her calves, her ankles gleam, stiletto valves, her patent black, her leather thighs, her hips, her canyon deep, her belly moon, her, her lion heart, she will not die, her life alone. She writes all wrongs with pen and speed, her battle song, she rides her roaring steed with tattoo sleeve, her corset vest, her helmet head, her bling, her angel wings. Her belly band conceals her carry. She wields her blade, her chain, her smith and wesson, her life unslain, her sisters too. She does not rue the blood not shed. She writes all wrongs, her life now spun in word and song. Mm -hmm.